Hello, I'm Susan Forey with a seriously sumptuous edition of The Big Middle, my free-range exploration of the big issues of longer, healthy midlife. A trailblazing effort to attract older workers to the restaurant trade is why I'm happily installed in the splendor of the Delaunay. It's a grand cafe in London's Covent Garden, old world Viennese elegance in the heart of Theatreland. This is one of the gems in the Corbin and King portfolio, gastro empire more like. Nine alluring London dining rooms, including the Wolsey, Brasserie Zadel, Fisher's Colbert, Belanger, and newcomer Soutine. Co-founder Jeremy King and Chris Corbin, his partner of 40 years, were the ones who gifted London with the iconic Le Caprice in the 80s and the Ivy in the 90s. Jeremy King, what a room! I adore this. It is, it is a wonderful room, and in fact, we were just discussing the fact that sadly a lot of restaurants are no longer actually investing it, and the, the whole tradition of restaurateuring is, is being compromised. And I'm put in mind of when, um, when we first opened here, and I sat down, it was actually Faye Mashler, uh, the critic for the Evening Standard, and she, she let out a bit of a sigh as she sat down. And so I said, what was that about? And she said, oh, it's just that having spent a lot of time recently in the more contemporary style of restaurant, and don't get me wrong, I love it, I love them very much, but when you sat on a rickety metal stool at an uncomfortable bar, next to the door with the wind howling through and you're drinking a cocktail out of a jam jar and uh, perhaps the bartender is more interested in reading his tattoos than the menu it's sometimes just lovely to get back into a more traditional napery on the table silverware so on and so forth just old-fashioned value i just love it it's why i take everyone to the wolsey i used to call it until five minutes ago the wolsley but you have said to me that i mean either is acceptable but how do you say it well most people say wolsey i I tend to call it wolsey and um which is it's very much in the tradition of english conniptions when it comes to explaining words so uh, in the same way that uh, American might go to Knightsbridge and walk down Beauchamp Place. <laughs> we'll discover it's actually really Beecham. And uh, when you see a family name like Chol Mondley, and discover it's actually Chumley. And so it's all part of that very even that Cadogan. Cadogan gets me every yeah, time. Absolutely. And yeah. it's uh, so sometimes uh, people think of it as a bit of a minefield when you come to London. Uncharitably, I often think that. It's in the way that we get very particular about whether you're using a napkin or a serviette. And I think it's, uh, it goes back to the time when people wanted to have the different strata of society, which yes. I'm very against. I'm against that as well, but I love the flourishes of old world elegance. I drag everyone to the Wolsey because I absolutely love and adore it. And it, I mean, you could have your flip-flops on. You wouldn't maybe yeah. ideally come in the door wearing your summer gear but you can and you'll feel comfortable no one will have their noses up in the ceiling and tell you to put on a jacket and a pair of boots absolutely in fact i was at an event yesterday and it was very hot and i kept my jacket on or as the british would call it a coat because um what we what we all refer to as a jacket is technically a coat over which you have an overcoat and underneath you have a waistcoat we play, play these All games. the layers. And somebody said to me, you've kept your jacket on. And I said, well, yes. And they said, that's very formal. I said, well, not really. I said, but nobody else has got a jacket on the table. And I said, well, I'd be happy taking it off. But uh, I'm a bit strange because I do feel where I never care whether somebody wears a jacket or a tie or anything like that. At the same time, if you put a jacket on, I prefer people to keep it on because we've all seen... There's particular groups of men who sit down in a restaurant and take off their jacket and roll up their sleeves. I'm conjuring just now, yes. And and loosening their their tie. The whole thing about the Wolsey is that it's it's democratic. There are very, very simple reasons behind our thinking. And one of them, it's fair to say that a lot of the most interesting people who go into London restaurants are actually the least affluent. And the thing about the Wolsey is that we give people the opportunity to spend, but we don't make it mandatory. So it doesn't matter what you're spending, what you're wearing, anything, you're made to feel welcome. I'm not rolling in it now, and I always, always 
think and plan ahead. I'm going to have the single eggs benedict. It is going to be my treat. And I thoroughly enjoy it because the surroundings are so splendid. But I could talk design with you for days, Jeremy, but we are here to speak about how you're shaking up your industry by putting out the welcome mat to mature workers. Yes, indeed. And I, I love, love the story behind this. Take us to New Orleans when the light bulb went off and you thought, hmm. Well, the light bulb went off in New Orleans and then stayed on in uh, New York. I'm walking into a restaurant in New Orleans called Pesh, quite a contemporary one, sort of in the warehouse district and extremely busy in the evening, not quite so at lunchtime. And I'd been highly recommended. I go in, we sit down, a waitress comes over, there's nothing wrong with what she's doing, but there is that sense, that suggestion that she's telling us that actually she's not going to be doing this for long um, because she's got a career ahead of her and whatever it might be. Now we happen to notice a booth come available, so we asked, would it be all right if we moved to the booth? Not for any other reason, for comfort. And we're told yes, and we sit there. And coming towards us is quite a large man. Turns out he's 55 years old. I go, okay. He looks, is he a guest or is he looking after us? And he was in jeans and a and a polo or something. And he opened his mouth and we melted because here was somebody who was just making us feel incredibly welcome and at ease. And as the French would say, he was bien dans sa peau. He was comfortable in his own skin. And he, we got to, he, he, was, he knew what we wanted, he was informative, it wasn't about him, it was about looking after us. So we got talking to him and he explained that he'd taken early retirement from a completely different job, always loved restaurants, always was sad that he'd never worked in a restaurant, so through a friend he had obtained this job where he was, I'd say 25 to 30 years older than most of the staff. And all credit to Pesh, they, they'd embraced him, he was happy, and he said, I, I couldn't be more fulfilled at the moment. You and felt visible to him, and your needs were oh yeah. front and centre, uppermost in his mind. Well, the thing about it is that he was, he was comfortable in what he was doing, a lot of people aren't uh, working in restaurants. He was financially secure. He wasn't thinking about his social life or his other aspects of his career or getting onto his phone to do social media or, or whatever. What the tips will be for tonight. Yeah, and he, he, was, he was relaxed about it. And so as far as he would see, his horizon was to do it a few years, maybe get promotion. Uh, he wasn't thinking, I have to move within a year or so to, to get more experience. Because Pesh was such a wonderful restaurant, they, he, he felt comfortable. And this is the interesting thing, is often in life we, ha we do things because we feel we should do them as opposed to want to do them. And uh, he was fortunate that he had a career that he wanted to do. And this then got, I suppose, highlighted by soon afterwards being in New York. And I was in a very trendy restaurant. I was eating at the bar by myself. And a guy came up to me. He too turned out to be in his 50s. And when he said, what can I get you? And they said, hang on. And then looked at me and he said, and this, this is something which can really irritate in the hands of the wrong person. He said, I'm thinking a vodka martini straight up with a twist. And he was right. And uh, you can get it so wrong. But the, absolutely. And, and it's presumptuous and it's irritating if it's in the hands. But there's something about it, his demeanor, the way he was saying it. And again, I started talking to him and I actually refer back to the experience in New Orleans. I said, you know, you're... The more I watched him, he was an incredibly good mover and very, very capable, very knowledgeable. He, everything presented well. I said, can I ask you, you must have been offered management jobs. He said, yes, but why would I want to do a management job? I, I'll be sitting in an office, checking stocks, doing orders, all that sort of thing. This is what I like doing. I make probably as good or better money as a manager, and I'm serving. And, that, and to be frank, I can throw myself into it. I don't have any worries. I don't have particular responsibilities other than giving people a good time so why would I do otherwise and I it made me think and that coming back to to London I started to look in to how many people we had in the company over the age of 50 now we have even at that time had a higher proportion than most because we had six percent of our workforce was over 50 and this is when a couple of years ago this or last year a couple of years ago and 
But if you look at the statistics for the UK workforce, 30% of people are over the age of 50, or they were at the time. And I met your doorman. I gave my card. Yes. He made sure that it got onto your yeah. desk. David, he was 74, he told yeah. me. And we had quite a chat, so much so that I had to make apologies afterward to my guest who was <laughs> heading to the airport and in a bit of a hurry. No, but, he, but D- David is, is very personable and wise, and, and he's seen a lot. There's something also about people over the age of 50 is a lot more intuition. And I think in this day and age, intuition and instinct uh, are not valued high enough. Uh, So much about hospitality is about process, asking questions, gratuitous questions, and not feeling it. And if we we allow ourselves to, to use our experience, and it's an old thing, if you treat people the way you want to be treated yourself, then you've got a great chance of of uh, making a success. Well, there's so much research, and I've learned so much in doing this podcast for the last eight months. A social gerontologist by the name of Jeanette Liardi, an American woman, I mean, she's big-brained, knows all about all of this, and and she went into great detail about how the two hemispheres of your brain finally, in your 50s, knit together the corpus callosum. And it's amazing, she said, so you get bi-hemispheric action on everything. So you have crystallized intelligence, you have more empathy, more emotional regulation. And I know you're 64, you're still 64, you haven't had a birthday? 65, okay. I'm 61 and even though I'm going through a weird time for me and I'm preternaturally optimistic that it will end soon, I realize all of the things that these people are telling me, the research, the studies, it's exactly as they say. I am so much calmer Mm. and more level-headed and Stuff, unless it's really important, it doesn't bother me. I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. I think as we as we get older, as, as long as we as long as we're reasonably balanced, because I think if you're out of balance as you get older, it can exacerbate. But if as long as we're in reasonable balance, we realise in, inherently that there's no point in getting upset about things that you're going to forget about in a week's time, or a month's time, or even a year's time, and so. And you'll only get upset, you'll only remember them if you act out. And so how important is it? doesn't mean to say you don't care. It's, it's you're less volatile, I think, in, Absolutely. When, you, when you get over the age of, of 50. There's balance in your thinking. Yeah. And you can apply it to situations. You've seen it before. The, the pattern recognition and the perspective kicks in. And it's effortless. At least I'm finding it effortless. I think the people who... I used to be a chief editor, chef de DCL in newsrooms, and I was hell on wheels. Mm. Psycho, racing around, demanding perfection from everyone, yeah. and hard work. I know I was hard work. Yeah, that, now I'm normal. so much easier to be yeah, around. It's normal. We, we, we've got a better idea of what we want from life. And um, I am particularly struck by this, this whole thing of uh, a certain calm, a certain sagacity, a, bit, a much, much better... Pre- approach to life but a lot of people don't understand it I mean when I remember when I first came to London in the early 70s the sort of thing you would see on the King's Road was there was one famous punk store where they said I hope I die before I get old <laughs> now a lot of people actually what do they define as old and good example is last year I was talking at a seminar for restaurateurs held by um, an accountancy firm who looked after them on various aspects of their business and they asked me to come and talk and they I was going to talk a little bit about something else but I uh, I had to change direction because they apparently the guy who got went on before me was saying listen Brexit's coming deal with it you're going to lose 70% of your staff at least um, it's, it's, it's going to be a disaster and so they were all a bit crestfallen and, uh, and asked me what's your feeling and I said well one of the things I think is true is that we adjust to situations. And I actually use them as um, by way of an example. I said, if at this moment, as I'm standing here, a bomb went off a few hundred yards away and rattled the window and noise, etc., we'd all be up and running from the room and screaming and panicking and so on and so forth. And yet... 75 years ago, if I was standing in this room in, say, well, say 1941, and the same happened, 
it would interrupt us for a few seconds. I'd look out the window, I'd say, that was close. Now where was I? Because you, And thus you the adjust. poster was born. Be absolutely. calm, carry you, on. Yeah, yeah, and you adjust. And we will, ad- even if Brexit goes through, and I'm not absolutely convinced it will, we would adjust. My staff often say, you know, what are we planning when, the, when it was the March 31st deadline? You know, what are we planning to do? I said, nothing, because everybody's going to be in the same way. And you can't stockpile. I'm, and everybody will understand. In many ways, it will be the Blitz spirit, which is, you know, my, was my illusion. So, and, it, and I started talking to them. I said, but there are other options. And I included in the options things like the great female workforce which is lost to the industry through motherhood. So we have to adjust. So no mother of young children can work in a kitchen unless they've got childcare and that defeats the project. Or can they? They drop the child off at school, the nursery or whatever, and then they could go to work. So and you have to change the kitchen pattern, have you have to kitchen. change the rotors Absolutely. and the expectations because... Because I mean, everybody when, expects you there at 8 o'clock in the morning and so on. But yeah, the can template can be ignored, can't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, and you can get the, the prep work, which they were going to do, it could be prepped elsewhere or by somebody specifically hired for it. It's being creative. And the other thing I talked about was um, hiring older people because they're a magnificent resource. And I know that... There's a lot of people, for instance, in my, in my own business, that we started writing to people who are much more mature, used to work for us, and said, what are you doing? You know, we'd love to hear, or maybe you'd like to come back. Oh, I think marvelous. in the last 12 months, we've rehired 100 people. That they is wouldn't, brilliant. Because they wouldn't have applied. If, uh, they wouldn't apply because they would think, oh, I'm too old, or they won't want me, or they think there's ignominy in returning, etc. And, and that went hand in hand with the, with the over 50 program. But, but it that is fantastic because we need to rehabilitate the whole process. Yeah. We know that being in service, waiting tables, or, or working front of house, it's, you know, as you found in New Orleans, and it wasn't the first time, there is an air of distraction often with the front of house people. Mm. They're almost looking down their noses mm. at you and transmitting that. This is only a pit stop for me. Yeah. I'm going to soon be the leader of whatever or a lot of entrepreneurs. And, and they don't engage with the customers the way older people who want to be there will do with, exactly. with a smile, and totally. an authentic smile. And they're more experienced and they want to work for you and they've come back and they're a great example. And they were scared maybe that there were, as I say, an ignominy in, in returning, but there's not. And the, But I went on to talk about the Over 50 initiative and then... Uh, we got on to question time and one guy put up his hand he's probably 25 years old and he said well it's all very well this hiring people over the age of 50 but what's the practicality of it I mean let's face it what's the practicality you <laughs> from you the to, eyes of a 25 year old he I thinks know. you'll need the slippers by oh, the front door no, no, no. as far as he was concerned that meant you had to make special concessions on rotor they wouldn't be able to work some hours you have to do this you have to do that it doesn't fit into a normal running of a restaurant i said okay i said be careful because at the time i was 64 i said you are talking to a 64 year old and perhaps i can ask you what time you got up this morning to start working was, well eight o'clock and I said well I was up at 5 30 and I'm going to be in the restaurants to 11 p.m. tonight what about you I said I'm not on any special diet or spe- special concessions you'd be su- you'd be surprised and it is amazing um, totally amazing how somebody 25 can have a, this other idea I actually, in, in their case, I, I then shocked them a bit. So I said, this is just as bad that you have, it in your, you have it in your heads if you're 25 years old, that, for instance, there is no such thing about such as sex after the age of 50. Wise up. There are people well into their 70s and 80s who, who are still having sex. And just the same way they're having sex, they're working in restaurants and they're active. 
it's a state, it's an entirely a state. We need to change the mindset across the age spectrum and blow up all these stereotypes. People are people are people. They have the same needs, wants, desires. The whole story about aging, the narrative that we've been sold since we were born and that has been embedded, internalized, in, is that it's decline and decrepitude. And that's what being older means. And older, depending on the 25-year-old, he obviously would think, 60 is older and you're not going to have sex, you're not going to be able to string a sentence together and shuffle on down, please. And there are 60-year-olds who behave that way, or certainly 65-year-olds. It's a state of mind. There's a very, um, well, the advice I give to any of my friends my age is certain simple things in terms of avoid, avoiding a state of mind is that, for instance, if you look at men, when they get up off a sofa or when they sit down, they make a noise. It's a very, it's, the, it's that oof, or, yeah. and it, you use it too often, and that is a surrender. And if you have been sitting down for a while and you stand up and your back is a little bit stiff, I used to watch my father, he used to shuffle along and make noises and so on. It becomes self-fulfilling, it yes, becomes absolutely. what you do and how you are. Exactly that. So, it happens to me sometimes, I have a chronic back problem, although actually better now than probably ever. I'll say, right, no, stand up, chest out, walk, walk round, and it's a state of mind. I see 80-year-olds who are younger in spirit and even to a degree body than 50-year-olds. I'm sure you do, and there's a body of research that American academic Laura Karstensen did. She's from the Stanford Center for Longevity. She found that 50% of 85-year-olds report themselves as having absolutely no health reason not to work. Amazing. I hadn't heard that statistic, but that, I, I, I love it because there is no reason other than psychological. It can become, as, as you say quite rightly, a self-fulfilling process. Well, that's why I'm doing this podcast. We need to shift the mindset off of this narrative. Culture is fluid. We need to change it. And there is a bit of a groundswell now. People are starting to give it more attention. It's not ever going to get as much attention as the other two biggie isms, racism and sexism. But there's, you know, intersectionality with all of this, and we need to tackle them all. The whole point, I mean, it's so short-sighted to be ages because you are going to be old yourself once. You know, you, you're never, you're never going to change your gender and, and or the colour of your skin. And not that I'm justifying either in any way, shape, or form. But it's we're preparing for the future. It's right? very short-sighted. Yeah. And the, the thing is too, and if anyone is looking at the tectonic demographic shifts that are underway. You have got to accept, if you're 22 now, you're going to be working for a very long time. And if we look at how the supports, the pillars of support of society, they are gone. There are no final salary pensions. Yeah. And civil societies, the unions uh, have been shredded. It's, it's very difficult. It is kind of the individual carries all the burden now, a yeah. lot, most of the burden. Yeah. So you're going to be working in the 60-year career for a 100 year life. Mm -hmm. Getting back to your hiring of 100 just recently, and these are all over 50? Over no, no, they're not all over 50. No, this is across the board, a lot young and some older. It's, it's just the point of reaching out to people and saying they're welcome, which we, we, we don't. We're passive, we sit and wait for people to apply. So you don't favor older applicants over younger ones, that would break employment law. How are you letting the olders out there know the welcome out is out and come on down? Yeah, there's quite a few ways. There are more and more sites, websites, which are actually specializing in this. And also just making it known through agents, through our adverts and so on, is that age is, is, not, an, is not an issue. And Would you have a 65-year-old front of house? Oh yes, well, we have a... Woman, I'm thinking. We have a, we have a 79-year-old woman front of house. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, um, at the Delaunay, uh, Shirley, but she is 79, so she probably, if I got the age wrong, she'll beat me up, but she, <laughs> her, she's lived all her time in Covent Garden, just wants to carry on. and. Uh, makes a hell of a difference and look just about all our principal people are starting to hit 50 or go or go beyond it but you see for me if you ask me 
who is our best employee hire of the year, has actually been a 19-year-old, as it happens. An incredible aptitude, natural. But where it really works is where she interacts with her 50-year-old manager because it, he feeds off her energy. And What's she, her role? She's a maitre d'hotel. Having had no experience whatsoever, she's gone from an assistant to what we'd call a lead maitre d'hotel and has extraordinary confidence and the 50-year-old is showing her how to do it better and how to do it with more understanding. And it's a, for me, that's the wonderful thing. And that's the whole point of being older, passing it on. And I'm a great believer that a lot of people don't realize what a good job they do and don't have enough self-worth until they teach other people how to do it. And this is one of, one of the beauties. There is such a drive now to get back to the way we were in the 50s and 60s, and, you know, to erase the 60 or so years of putting people in age silos. We need to mm. mix it back up, get the generations oh, yeah. on the same floor, working together and reverse mentoring. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, actually, a lot of those people who were very young in the 60s are still here, and they are mentoring, and they are making a big, big difference. And as long as they remain positive, the, the the sad thing in the restaurant business is a lot of people who are unfulfilled because they had their dreams and because the nature of the business is much better now. They weren't helped, guided, or structured to go through a career path which would have suited them to become a head chef, a general manager, a proprietor of themselves. We try to help people. Because for me, it's much more important that people are positive and fully concentrated in their work for a shorter period than being with us a very long time just for the sake of it. Because whilst the, whilst the people over their 50s can bring so much to a business, they can also hold a business back. Because if they've been in the same place for 30 years, and there is a danger, though, of people staying in the business for a long, long time without evolving and without getting new challenges and being excited. And it's quite a reactionary business. People don't like change very much. And, and I, I bore my staff to death quoting Prince Tancredi from The Leopard by uh, Lampedusa who says, in response to people moaning about change, he said, if things are to remain the same, everything has to change. And it's a, it's a really important aspect. So, But you, you guide your employees. Do you have career development sessions with them one-on-one -on -one, yeah, or get the managers involved in getting to know what's going to light them up, even though they have 30 years of service with you? Yes. I, I, we try to work quite hard at that. And we move people around and we just try to enthuse them and to excite them and take on the new technology. And, and as I say, it's, it's important that they understand how good they are. The, the sad thing about employment in the restaurant business is a lot of people don't realize how good they are until they've left. But the thing is, it's the money as well. It's always been low wage, minimum wage, you're disposable. It, but you run classical dining rooms, high quality, premium quality places. So it's not that cookie cutter concept chain no. out there where people are a dime a dozen. No, and a lot of people become very proud of their existing restaurant. And, and we, there are, we're sitting here at the Delaunay and a lot of people who've been here since the, the day we opened. There's some people who came here having been with us elsewhere and there's a lot to be encouraged in that and as long particularly if they're going through the gears so to speak in terms of promotion and, and learning and that that's wonderful if, if you can but we we're not a great industry for developing people it's it's a lot better than it ever was and are you trying to change that yeah and it's a, yeah. it's a so much better profession than it was 40 years ago when we when we opened our first restaurant, Best Park. I was doing an induction yesterday with new staff, and I said, you've spent the whole day in induction, you're spending an hour and a half with me. Um, it's very complex, there's lots to learn, health and safety, through to ethos and, and so on. I said, in 1981, somebody would have greeted you in and then thrown 
an apron at you and say, get on with it. And you'd be fighting for the tip pool at the and, end of the day. Uh, yeah, or whether you're in the kitchen or that, you'd be thrown by a man because inevitably it's going to be a male male dominated kitchen etc which we're working incredibly hard at the same time that we're trying to increase our over 50 quotient um, the we're also working steadily and having more women in the restaurant what's but your percentage now at the moment women is 38 uh, percent which actually isn't bad in, in uh, our sort of restaurant but we want to get it up to 50 percent fantastic and what let's get back to your age profile now across the board how has it changed since you laid down that welcome mat to over 50s uh i don't have the statistics to hand i'm only an anecdotal on it we've got a, quite a few more and certainly amongst the returnees but and i in fact we've just been discussing that accelerating it even more so as we go into september and, and october and I will be much happier when we have about 20% or more over 50. I don't think we can get the national average because, of course, a high proportion are, are uh, desk-bound operators and you know, there, there, there are certain physical challenges. What about that 25-year-old at that event where you were giving an address? Did you manage to change his mind? I mean, I, you're out there proselytizing about this, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I, he, he was... Uh, an operations director of a little group of two restaurants over in Hack Hackney and uh, he said afterwards actually it did make me think I, but there again there's not many people who are as visionary as Pesh and if you are if you're a very contemporary restaurant very hip so social media driven terrible acoustics loud music it's, it's uh, harder to get people to uh, to feel welcome and comfortable if they're it's in their like 50s. It's like olders on the dance floor. You know, over 50s, people, what, suddenly don't like dancing? Yeah, I, I love dancing. Yeah. And yet you think, oh, everyone, I wouldn't care. You know, I would actually probably dye my hair pink just to go out that night because I don't care what anyone says. And that's the other beauty of racking up the years. I mean, you just lose that sense of what are people thinking about you? You learn, they're not. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Reading about you and your age diversity and inclusion drive, I was struck by some of the accounts in trade magazines routinely calling older workers the elderly. You know, I was, I was looking into the industry journals. And 50s and 60s now are hardly elderly. You and I, case in point. Do you feel elderly? No, I don't feel elderly. I, you know, my body is still good in good shape. It's interesting, isn't it? The elderly is a very different context to elders. Um, and sort of a, the elders of, of society is actually probably what it comes down to, is the people who are able to lead and wise and, and not disposable, that they are considered to be at the, at the pinnacle. And that's how I, I like to think of people in their 50s. They should be the ones at the pinnacle. Have you come across Chip Conley? No. He, he, ran, he was a hotelier in the States, and he ran a boutique hotel chain called Joie de Vivre. Oh, yeah. He's an alum of the podcast. And then he was tapped after he'd sold the hotel, just wanted to do something different. He was tapped by, by the young guys at Airbnb to be a mentor, to be mm. the elder. And now he's doing a, an academy, a modern elder academy, inviting people who are feeling that bewildering time of transition and change and wanting something different at halftime. You know, it's structured workshops as well as just reflecting and talking about what your desires are and, and ways to push back and destroy the, the media-led narrative that's embedded in all of us about what it means to be getting older. Mm. Yeah, somebody had mentioned him, and I, but I didn't in any way remember the name. I must look him up because he sounds very, very interesting. But that, that's, that's the point, to go back to my 50-plus manager with a 19-year-old recruit. So much to learn both ways. She keeps the, the older one younger and on their toes, and, and he... She benefits from his superior knowledge and experience. And it's the perfect recipe, and it's what we all strive for. We need to get the five generations across the board. But there are, there are an estimated one million 
people over 50 who are languishing on the sidelines of life because they've lost their jobs. And once you've lost your job, it is so much harder to get into work. They've done study after study about it. So all of these people, we need to find a way of giving them access back into society so they can be engaged and vibrant and and contribute again. Yes, yeah, so there is the problem, the British psychology, that being in service is not so enviable a profession as it may be in America. But I think that's changing. And the beauty of the, of the restaurant business is that if you do show aptitude, you can rise through the ranks three or four times quicker than you can in most industries. Have any of your over 50s made leaps yeah, up no, the ladder? Absolutely, and moved around the restaurants, gone into more se senior positions, and uh, it's happening all the time. And I got a whole slew of them in their late 40s coming, coming through, and I, they're still thinking they're very young, which is, which is great, but there'll come a point where they need to uh, adopt their mentor role as well. Perfect, that's what we want. That interchange of knowledge yeah. and ideas that, that happens naturally when people are mixing together. It's when they're stuck in their retirement homes and silos or feeling as if they're shut out of life in general because they can't get an interview, they don't seem to be in demand merely because of their chronological age. It's absolutely ridiculous absolutely. on every and single level. And there's so much to offer. I had Stuart Lewis of Restless on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. And, oh, yeah. uh, his team's analysis of government data shows the part-time workforce is being driven by the over 50s more than any other age group. Are most of your older recruits part-timers? The older? No, no. Um, Somebody like David, the doorman that uh, you met, he'd be a part-timer. We've got quite a few of our doormen are on two, three, four nights a week, but that's part of the nature of the job because we only have doormen in the evening. It's hard life to, to work necessarily six nights a week. Most of them are, are working fully. Uh, and you give them proper contracts, benefits. It's it oh a proper yeah. job. With, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's in this gig economy, zero hours contracts, it's yeah. the average take-home pay for over 50s scrabbling about to get little part-time work and keep, keep keep the fridge filled and the bills paid is 10 grand a year. No, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Subsistence, and, and we know the pension age, 66 in 2020, and they're going to just keep ratcheting that up. Unless, hopefully, are you familiar with the all-party parliamentary committee on longevity? They're, they're trying to put together a plan. They're just getting started and hopefully... This will lead to some real change in government policy, whereby, I don't really know though how you force corporates. You can't really, no. because here everyone's quite independent. It's not like, it's not like here in China. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> the I, government I, has no role in forcing business people to do anything other than even pay their taxes mm -hmm. if you're Amazon. No, it's a, it, but I think that there are initiatives which are going to come through and there has been some interest. The trouble is the government's been paralyzed the last three years by the by the whole Brexit question and wouldn't deal with anything. Now we have a new Prime Minister who might be volatile. <laughs> their, their game may get things done. Who That's knows? a careful adjective to apply to the new Prime Minister. Um, what about your your customers? Have they, have they ever, you know, the 79-year-old you said her name was Shirley, do they ever pass comment? Or is she just so engaging and vibrant? Yeah, Who would I, dare to say anything? I think, I think a lot of people would look, look at Shirley and not even think that she's that, that old necessarily because um, the way she, she carries it. Um, if I've got the age wrong, forgive me, Shirley, because it's sort of immaterial. If you told me that Shirley was 55, I would believe you. And uh, so, no, the... Occasionally you get comments, but it's, it, what's interesting is, of course, is that because we've been going so long, we're seeing a lot of our customers start to, to become much less active, and so we're seeing their children, or indeed their grandchildren, and uh, I feel in our employment we should reflect society. Well, your dining room, we are see, we're at the Delaunay here, right near the front entrance, and I've seen all ages. Mm. And some little kids as yeah. well were coming in with their parents. And I mean, you want to be an all-age-friendly place. Exactly. I'm, I, um, we have a lot of people who go to the, to the restaurants because 
the the grandchildren love them so much. You know, they say, well, can we go back to that place? In fact, up at our new place, Soutin, I, there was a table two weeks ago which had four generations on, which is for me is perfect. Four generations all, all sitting together. Oh, beautiful. That must have been marvellous to see. And that's the way it works. That's the way it works all over the continent, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Why is the UK odd man out as ever? Mm. You know, really, you live in Spain, you go to Italy, my favourite country, France, where I've lived a couple of times. Everybody mixes it up. You just don't think about age the way they do here. Here, you're siloed and in the States as well. You know, olders are sort of looked down upon and why are you here? And you can't exempt uh, a person from society just because they are older than you, just because they're over 50. No, you, you can only excise them from society on behavioral terms rather than anything else. They can exclude themselves. We must never do so. Do you reflect much on your own immediate future? how your life might go as you rack up the years? For me, um, I was asked the question yesterday at induction, what will happen in five years, what will happen in ten years? I said, and I said, well, I have no doubt that I will be here in five years' time. As to whether I'll be here in ten years' time, I'm not sure. Um, the role of old restaurateurs used to be they'd stay in the restaurants and go around and change the ashtrays, but we don't have ashtrays anymore, so uh, we'll have to find Thanks another B. role. Thanks, B. Now, remind us, too, I would be very remiss in not asking you this. You had a very interesting path from wine bar manager to here. Uh, you had a spell in merchant banking, uh, deciding not to take your place at Cambridge University, and a roll of the dice was involved. Yeah. Please, please fill in the blanks on that one. Yeah, that was... Um, I always recommend people not to do anything that I did regarding the dice. That, that was purely because Luke Reinhardt had this cult novel in 70... I'm not sure if it was 71 or 73, but which I rather liked, and he, he determined, that, determined all his life choices on the throw of a dice, which set in New York um, at a contemporary time, and it, it was fun, and I used to use it to determine social things or determine who I was at work that day because I was bored but unfortunately I used it to determine whether I went to university or not as and you really threw the dice and that was the, the decision this particular throw was 12 options rather than 6 and most of the options were about going up this is to Cambridge two or three were going up and changing the course I a couple about um, delaying going up having another year off because I was having fun and this is when you were at the wine bar at the wine bar and I was waiting to go up I'd left merchant banking because I thought I was going to earn quite a lot of money somewhere and go traveling but I the only way to earn money is hard selling and I'm not a, I'm not a salesperson so I carried on working the wine bar and then they put me up to system manager even though I was going and uh, I threw the dice and the, the the option which was put in as a last moment to say and I suppose Freud would have told me that there must have been a certain amount of longing for the option is that if I got managership at the wine bar or similar within a month of being qualified, which was 21, you can have a license until you're 21, then I'd stay in the, in the business for life. And that's what came up, and I got the managership. What was your family reaction? Uh, Cambridge wine bar manager. They, 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 um, they were so disappointed. They'd been disappointed when I turned down the university the first time. Come the second time, it was... My mother was heartbroken, but she said to me, as long as you don't wake up when you're 30 and start regressing. And I think there's an element that I did, but an element that I didn't. I, I, I could call it both ways. And, and you've uh, made beautiful celebration restaurants for people. And, and, and a lot of the things which I was interested in, which I perhaps thought I couldn't do as a profession, like being an architect or a performer or writer or something, I get fulfillment in different ways through the restaurant. So it's not a bad profession for me at all. Well, the design never... alone, you worked hand in glove with the late, great designer David Collins, putting together these places. Yeah, I, I, I did. David and I, well, we started working with Sheikers and then we were using the same architects who, who did the ivy to do uh, the Woolsey, and it wasn't working out. And David was begging, come on, please, let me do it. I'll do it for free. He lied, um, but we eventually <laughs> gave it to him. And, and although actually he had plans to change it quite radically, make it more modern, so he stopped. But he did a great job 
Because so it was a lot of arm twisting and you guys yeah, having some he, he heated discussions. Sure. But what he was good at was um, melding the new elements of the Woolsey with the old elements of the building. And that's where David was particularly good. He well, went the blue on. bar at the Barclay is stunning. Absolutely, although I think they've changed it now. Um, oh, no. We did fight a lot, though, and that's for sure. We did fight a lot, and the Delaunay was actually saw sort of come onto the scene uh, Shane Brady, who was working for David Collins, and he worked with us on Zadell and Colbert, and then left David. I, it's fair to say I fell out a bit with David at the time. I loved him dearly, but we, we did fight. And then Shane opened up his own business and went on to do Fishers and Belanger and Café Woolsey at Bista and Soutine and for us. And the discerning aesthete in you could never give carte blanche to someone. Not carte blanche, but there again, I, I find with, with Shane what happens is that I might have an idea and give him the kernel of that idea and he comes back to it with it with having grown it um, and then we might evolve it again and we discuss it and share the ideas it's for me it's the perfect working relationship i wouldn't want to work with any other designer oh, it's so nice when you can find that sort of creative collaboration now do you have a pithy reminder to self or a mantra when you're feeling down about anything to g you up get you inspired yeah, about things i, I think when we have, there's certain things I do. I think if um, in adversity I look for the positive things. So um, I always remember fully realizing this when I was in my car, which is an old vintage car, and I realized that somebody was about to drive into the side. They lost control of the car. And the way I deal with a, a situation like that is I then think, well, it needs a respray. And <laughs> You're already planning ahead, I, I, it's in so the I, shop. And I constantly do that. So occasionally I'm unable to uh, see the bright side in a, in a scenario. But the other, and apart from what I mentioned before, is that I, when I'm feeling dark, I don't allow myself to get darker because I know that actually whatever it is which is affecting me is probably going to disappear quite soon. So you're good at self-regulation? Absolutely. And then the other aspect is when I have a lot of problems which are taking me down, I have a rule, which I learned in the early 80s, you divide your problems into happy problems and unhappy problems. And you actually find that your problems are very small. And yes, happy problems might you know, be, or could be anything mundane, like overbooked or whatever, it, whatever the problem might be. But they're all happy problems. You wouldn't want it other, otherwise. Um, There's no blood on the floor, yeah, no so, lives lost. Yeah, that's the way I deal with things. What do you do for kicks when you're not spreading the stardust all over your empire? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm very good at, at getting kicks. I, I, I think a lot of my happiness comes from interaction and solitude. It's quite important to me that I have time by myself. So I might go and cycle or I might do any number of things by myself. And so that example you gave of you being in one of the restaurants from <laughs> early in the morning until late at night, that's not every day then. You carve out no, some time I, I for yourself. I get up very early most days and I tend, to, I tend to try and control my emails by 7.15, 7.30 so that when I go to the restaurants I'm not so burdened by it. Um, kicks come in different ways. I don't have any particular group of things which I retreat into. I'm not a gym bunny. I, I do cycle because I like the independence of that. Where would you live if you could immediate, let's say tomorrow, everything changed for whatever reason and you had to choose a spot outside of the UK to live the rest of your lives? I always thought that that would be in France. Is, um, could be Italy, but I always thought it would be France. I, mean, I speak French much better, so I'd feel more comfortable. I would go rural. I've never been able to live rurally because, of course, the nature of my business. I'm a restaurateur rather than a restaurant owner. Well, like, I can't really, having met you, and you're beautifully turned out in your, is it Timothy? Everest. Yeah. Timothy Everest suit. It's the hottest day of the year, and you are impeccably dressed. I can't imagine you lying on a towel or near a, under an umbrella in the Côte d'Azur. No, I don't really want to be on that towel in the Côte d'Azur. I, I want to be more in central France, and... Uh, I'd rather be in the shadow. Hiking reading. and biking and yeah, yes. and reading and, and so on. What's the book on your your nightstand now? 
I've got, um, I suppose the one which I'm most into at the moment is Edmund White saying the un uh, his book, The Unpunished Vice, which is about his history of a life of reading. Fantastic. Uh, tomorrow, you get your pick of a seat at a chef's table of your dreams. Where would that be? Which chef? Oh, it would always be Ruthie Rogers. In the, the River yeah. Cafe, where I've had many a nice meal. Fantastic spot. Now, one final question before, before we have to surrender this beautiful forest green leather banquette. And is this ebony, this wood? No, it's not. That, that's actually a lacquered wood rather than ebony. Oh, it's black lacquer, yeah. stupendous. And the, is it deco? There's an element of deco about the place. It's just yes, beautifully wrought. Yes. You don't find this at a chain restaurant these days. So if you empty your pockets right now, um, am I going to spot a die? No, no. In fact, um, I like an element of chance. I used to enjoy gambling a lot, but I, I stopped that. I prefer to trust my instinct and my intuition. Is that how you've made this empire with your, your partner, yeah, uh, Chris Corbin? So, because you seem so affable and, <laughs> you know, you're not a hard-driving, hard-sell guy. Oh, which, which means I probably would have made more money if I was. But I, I think we have longevity and, and we have a very, very, very simple way of looking at it. Is that too many restaurateurs are trying to generate income. But what we preach is that you must never look at somebody walking through the door as a source of income. You can only look at them as an opportunity. And, and it's an opportunity to give somebody a good time. And if you give them a good time, then you'll make money. Uh, I've had many a good time at the Wolsey. And can you please give David at the door a big hug? It is him certainly following will. through on his promise to pass you my card so we could do this. I really appreciate it. I'll certainly do that. Jeremy King, the co-owner of Corbin and King Restaurant Group, shifting ageist industry attitudes, boosting the odds of unemployed over 50s, of getting a job in one of his gorgeous grand cafes. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. Links to all on the show page of The Big Middle at my website, susanflory.com. Wonderful to have your ears on the pod. I am signing off for the summer. I'll be, I'll be back in September, so see you then. Mm -hmm.